Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, well, I'm very pleased to introduce Rich Carana today. He's an assistant professor at Cornell. Um, and a well-known machine learning expert. He's uh, got his PhD back in CMU in 1997 and has been in various places like Just System Research, if you remember what that was, and has been a professor at Cornell. And he's well-known for doing uh, interesting kind of new models in machine learning, such as um, uh, clustering with hints or uh, multitask learning. That was some of your original work. So he's going to talk about model compression today. Thank you very much, John. Um, this back. So I want to thank uh, John and Chris both for inviting me back for a second time and helping to arrange the visit. So I'm going to be here for the next uh, two days, so, but uh, I'll be in this building today. So if anyone wants to try to grab me, please, please try. So okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, model compression. This is um, new work uh, we've been doing just the last couple of years. So this is work in progress, so I can't give you the sort of final answers here. Um, and it's joint work with uh, two students uh, at Cornell, uh, Christy Busia and Alex Nikulescu. And Alex is uh, just finishing up right now. So, um, and first, I guess, let me, whoops, let me tell you what I'm not going to talk about. So, I'm probably best known for my work in inductive transfer and multitask learning. So, I'm not going to be talking about that sort of thing at all. And uh, as John mentioned, I've done some work in semi-supervised clustering and meta-clustering. That would be a fun thing to talk about, actually. I almost decided to talk about that. And John said there are some people here who are interested in the compression stuff. So, so I decided I'd talk about compression instead. Um, I won't talk much about learning for different performance metrics, although that's going to come up in this talk. Uh, and I won't talk at all about medical informatics. Um, we've been doing some fun stuff in the citizen science arena, learning from very messy citizen science bird data. And it's really fascinating. We, we've come up with some cool ways of regularizing models when things are this noisy. And I'm not going to talk at all about microprocessors. In fact, there is a, a person who joined Microsoft Research a year ago, Engin Ipek, who's been my collaborator in this work. So, so if you're interested in that, he, he's here. So, so go look him up. OK, so those are things I won't talk about. So I am going to talk about model compression. But I'm going to start and spend, you know, it might be the first 10 or 15 minutes talking about something else to help motivate the need for model compression. Because um, I don't want it to look like an academic e exercise. I want you to realize why you really have to have something like this. So I'm going to sort of talk about Bryman's constant. That's almost a joke. It's an allusion to Planck's constant in physics. Um, and then I'll spend most of the time talking about ensemble selection, wh which motivates why we'll need to do this compression. And then I'll actually jump into compression and talk about density estimation um, and show you some results and, and then the, the future work. OK. So let's see. Does everybody here have a machine learning background for the most part? Mostly. OK, great, great. So I can skip sort of the machine learning intro that I prepared just in case people didn't. And let's jump right to the fun stuff. So, so let me tell you about Bryman's constant. Um, so, so Leo Bryman and I were uh, you know, at a conference, maybe 96, 97, chatting during a break. And he said something like, you know, it's weird. Every time we come up with a better performing model, it gets more complex. So we were talking about boosting and bagging and you know, how, how decision trees, one of their beauties had been that they were intelligible. And now that we were boosting and bagging them, you know, we had even lost this beautiful property of decision trees. Um, and, and it wasn't that a shame. And, and sort of jokingly, I, I said, oh, they're like linked variables, you, you know, Planck, Planck's constant that you can't. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, you know, you, you can't know, um, you know, both the location of an electron and its momentum, you know, both to infinite precision at the same time. If you know one well, then you. In, currently know the other less accurately. And, and I sort of joked that, well, maybe something like this is true in machine learning. And uh, if, the, uh, if the error of the model is low, then the complexity must be high and vice versa. So there's this natural trade-off. And it, the reason why I put this here, I mean, it's mainly a humorous way to start the talk. But we are going to be talking about this sort of thing, it, you know, model complexity and how big does the model have to be if it's going to be accurate. Is it always going to be the case that the most accurate models are humongously big? And, all that sort of stuff. And ultimately, compression is going to sort of try to get around this, this, uh, this simple statement. So, um, 
Okay. Um, here's a huge table. Don't worry. <laughs> Uh, this table is taken from some other work I've done, and I'm just going to use it to motivate the, the need for this model compression stuff. But I am going to have to explain it. There's a lot of numbers here. Let me walk you through it, and it'll suddenly make sense. And I promise there'll be a lot more pictures coming later in the talk that, that you won't have to, to look at these sorts of things. Here we've got families of models, all different kinds of boosted decision trees, uh, a variety of random forests with different parameters and different underlying tree types a variety of bag decision trees, uh, support vector machines with lots of different kernels and lots of different parameter settings, uh, neural nets of different architectures trained with different learning rates and momenta and things like that, different ways of coding the inputs. So a variety of neural nets. Every memory-based learning method we could think of, including combinations of them, there's, there's actually 500 different combinations of these hidden under that. Um, boosted stumps, there's a relatively small class. Vanilla decision trees, there's only a, a dozen flavors of decision trees. Logistic regression, run a few different ways and with a few different parameter settings. And also naive bays, run a few different ways. So it turns out that this represents, this column, 2,500 different models that we've trained for every problem we're going to look at. So we really went crazy. We, we did everything we could think of to train good models on these problems. And then we went a little crazier. PLT stands for plat. So so we, uh, some of these models don't predict good probabilities right out of the box. Others do, like n neural nets can predict pretty good probabilities, as can k-nearest neighbor, but it turns out boasted trees don't tend to predict good probabilities, uh, nor do SVMs, unless you do some work. So, so John Platt came up with a method for calibrating models. You first train the model, then you apply Platt calibration as a post-calibration step to improve the quality of the probabilities, and it turns out that works very well. Uh, there's also a competing method, isotonic regression, which also is, is good in other circumstances. It turns out John's method, to, to just summarize a, a, a piece of work we did a couple years ago, John's method works exceptionally well if you have limited data, which you often have when doing this calibration step. If you have lots of data, then the isotonic, because it's an ultimately more powerful class of, of models, uh, may work better if you've got lots of data. But if you have little data, you should stick with Platt's method. Star means you didn't need to do any calibration. So we've taken this 2,500 models, and now we've calibrated them all using Platt's method, using isotonic regression, and not using any method. So in fact, this becomes 7,500 models if you do the, the three different calibration methods. OK, so we have 13 different test problems that we're working on. And what we do is, we do everything we can to train a good boosted decision tree on every one of those test problems to get the accuracy as high as we can. OK, yeah, question? What's the size of the problems? Oh, good, good. So all these problems have dimensionality about 20 to 200. And it turns out the train sets, we've artificially kept the train sets modest at about four to 5,000 points, even though on some of these data sets we have 50,000 or, or more points. And that's to sort of make the learning challenging, uh, and it's also to make the experiments computationally feasible. Um, yeah. So, it, is, do you need more information, or is that good? Are these coming from UCI data set kind of things? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So, so half of these are from UCI because you sort of have to use UCI so that other people can compare, and the other half are, are things for which I really have collaborators who care about the answers. Um, because I don't believe in sort of overfitting to UCI. So, so and, and of course, we put in more effort to the ones that we have real, real collaborators for. So it's, it's a good question. OK, so, uh, so what have we done? I'm just summarizing other, other work here. This is really still motivation. But if you don't understand what, I'm, what the numbers are, it won't, won't help motivate things. So what have we done here is we've trained as many boosted decision trees as we could on each of those problems. And using a validation set, we've picked the particular one that's best for each problem for accuracy. And in fact, there's five-fold cross-validation under here, so these numbers are fairly reliable. And then we've normalized these scores so that for every performance measure, no matter what it is, even for like squared error, we've normalized it so that one is truly excellent performance. Nothing really should be able to achieve one because we had to cheat to get, get that high quality. And zero would be baseline, so, so hopefully nothing's doing near your baseline. So basically, just think of these as a number near one means really, really good. Which, sure. And they are all binary classification problems. In fact, the, the few problems that weren't binary classification problems, we turned them into binary classification problems. Um, and that's why we can do things like AUC, the area under the RC curve. 
Yeah, thank you for asking that. So, okay, so this is the average performance that we could achieve with a whole bunch of boosted decision trees with and without calibration on the 13 problems when we're doing model selection for accuracy. And then this is the average performance we could get when we were trying to optimize for F-score, which you might not be familiar with, but don't worry, it's not going to be important for the talk. Uh, and this is the best we could do for lift, and this is the best we could do for area under the rock curve, best we could do for average precision, the precision recall break-even point for squared error and for you know, our good, good friend log loss. So, so that's the best we could do with boosted trees, and this is the best we could do with random forests. Okay, so and remember, number, these are averages over many experiments. Different models are being picked for different metrics and for different problems, but they're all boosted decision trees in the first row. They're all random forests in the second row. Different neural net architectures in this row, but whatever is best for each problem. Okay, so this is sort of the big average picture of performance and looking at different metrics. Um, and then this is the average, this last column. So that's the average performance across all the metrics. One advantage of normalizing scores in the way we've done it is the semantics are pretty similar from score to score and from problem to problem, so it actually makes some sense to, to average across them this way. So, so that's our real motivation for having done that. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. It turns out that differences uh, in this final column of about 0.01 are, are typically significant. So. Um, here, we're not averaging over quite as many things, so it's 0.01 is possibly significant. Sort of sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. It's difficult, by the way, to do real significance testing. We've got five-fold cross-validation under the hood, and it turns out the performance on the different metrics is highly correlated. If you do well on some metrics, you do well on the other metrics. So it means they're not truly independent, so you, it's hard to know. It, anyway, um, so when I bold things, I mean that we've sort of looked at the numbers behind the scenes, done some sort of simple t-tests, and if we've bolded them, that means you should view those things as statistically identical. It's not a reliable test, so it doesn't mean that every time things are bolded, they are indistinguishable, and if they're not bolded, they are distinguishable. But, but I just wanted to guide your eye, uh, because I realize you can't scan big tables of numbers like these. And in fact, if you want to focus on the mean, that'll be fine, although these other columns will be, be important later on. Okay, so what have we got? We've sorted things by overall performance, right? So boosted decision trees are sort of at the top of the table, but if you look at this mean performance over here, it'll turn out this is a three-way tie, really, for first place in mean performance. So, so boosted trees, random forest, and bag trees are all doing exceptionally well across all of these metrics and across all these problems. Mm -hmm. Limited depth trees for the boosted trees, or did you...? Ah, so, uh, so we tried everything every kind of tree we could, and including lots of different parameters for the trees. So, so we grow full-size trees and boost them. We grow reduced trees and we boost them. We also do something with boosting that some people do and don't do. We do early stopping, which is we boost one iteration, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, out to 2048. And the validation set is allowed to pick whichever iteration is best. And that helps boosting a lot, by the way. It wouldn't be at first place in this table if you didn't do that. And that uh, <laughs> so surprisingly, so, so some people don't do that. And there's one problem here, by the way, where, where boosting starts overfitting on its first iteration, uh, which means that the validation set prefers iteration one, which is before any boosting has occurred. <laughs> uh, and every iteration after that actually goes downhill on most metrics. So, um, so, so it turns out boosting would not be doing this well. Boosting is a very uh, you know, high variance, risky method, but when it works, it works great. Uh, random forests are, are doing so well for a completely different reason. They're just sort of reliable time and time again. They never really grossly fail. And, and similarly, bag trees are, are pretty reliable. Okay, so, yeah. Maybe philosophical, but you mentioned you have a three-way tie for first place. Isn't that more like a five-way tie for first place? Um, yeah, so, so it turns out these, these are statistically distinguishable as far as we can tell. Uh, no matter, we, we've done a bunch of bootstrap analysis of the data, and we always get this sort of same picture. Maybe, maybe two of these things would change places, but we never see these things move into the top or those things move down. So, so we tend to believe that SVMs and neural nets uh, really are in this sort of tie for, well, it's not second place, it's you know, third and a half place. Um, <laughs> uh, four and a half place, I'm sorry. 
Um, oh, by the way, uh, so don't overfit <laughs> to these results. These are all problems of modest dimensionality, 20 to 200, if you're doing bags of words. In fact, we've done, we've repeated this kind of experiment in high dimensions. The story is quite different in high dimensions, so if you want, I can tell you about that sometime. Uh, as you would expect, the linear methods really come of their own once the dimensionality breaks, say, 50,000 or 100,000. Um, but, but for th the world where you've got, say, 5,000 training points, binary classification, uh, modest dimensionality, th this does seem to be a, a pretty consistent story. So, and people have told us, oh, your story is like this only because you forgot to include models that had this, uh, data sets that had these difficulties. So then we added those data sets and the story didn't change. So, so uh, okay. Some interesting things. Um, uh, let me come back to that in a second. Interesting things are the top of the tree is ensemble method. Uh, I'm sorry, the top of the table is ensemble methods of trees. So and I didn't necessarily expect that when we started doing that, that work. So that's kind of interesting, and that itself is going to be sort of part motivation for the, com the need for the compression work. You never, I meant to ask you in last week, you never sure. tried ensemble methods of logistic regression. Now, now, although we have done ensemble methods of uh, perceptrons and voted perceptrons, and they do pretty comparably, especially in high dimensions, to logistics sometimes. So we've done ensembles of those. It's not here, but yeah. And they don't do as well uh, as these, except in very high dimension. V very high dimension, the story is quite different. So, in fact, logistic regression all by itself in extremely high dimension uh, starts to match the performance of the best of these. Uh, I'll tell you, boosted trees, it turns out, don't hold up very well in very high dimension. To our surprise, random forests just take high dimensionality in stride and do extremely well in high dimensionality. Neural nets also do surprisingly well in high dimension. I did not anticipate that. I thought they would also have trouble. Uh, and then SVMs, because we include linear SVMs in our mix of SVMs, they also do very well in high dimension because you end up picking the, the linear kernels for SVMs. Uh, no, no. In, in that case, you know, in very high dimensions, you, you sort of have to have more data. So we're using the natural size of these other 12 test problems that we have. So in some cases, it's as much as uh, several hundred thousand points in the train set. Uh, good, good question, yeah. With, with 5,000 points in the train set, I don't know if 100,000 dimensions would, would mean much. It, very, very good. Okay, so the tree methods are doing very well. Now, you might think, you might look at this table, hey, great, nice answer for machine learning. As long as we use one of these ensembles of trees, we've got our top performer, works really well across all sorts of metrics. Great, great, you know. You'll be sort of sad if you're an SVM aficionado because, you know, it didn't quite make it to the top. Turns out that's not the, not the conclusion you should draw. I've added one more line to the table. Remember, this is the best we could do with boosted trees. This is the best we could do with random forests. This new line, we're just agnostic as to method. We take the 7,500 methods we've trained down here, and we just use the validation set to pick the best one. Okay, so, so this gets to use anything it wants. And the surprise to me is not that it's better. You'd expect it to be better. It's how much better <laughs> is the surprise. So remember, this was like a three-way tie for first place, and then you know, these guys were sort of coming in second. Well, the differences here are dwarfed by this difference. Okay, so, so this tells you that it's not the case that boosted trees or random forests uh, or bag trees are always consistently one of the best models. Okay, the only way to get that large difference is if occasionally some of the models down here are the models that are best. And in fact, when you look at the details, you, you see that. You see there are problems for which logistic regression, whose average performance is not so high, logistic regression is the best model by a significant amount on this problem. And if you didn't use it, you actually are going to lose significant performance because these models don't do it on that problem. And there's another problem for which uh, boosting fails miserably. Random forest, none of the tree methods truthfully do, do very well, but it turns out boosted stumps do extremely well on, on this problem. And if you weren't looking at boosted stumps, you would have trained an inferior model. So, yeah. Just to make sure, so yeah. the procedure for producing that first row is you're, you're, taking the, uh, you're, taking, you're taking the validation set and finding the best model, and then that's the number on the test set. Uh, yes, 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 yeah. thank, thank you, right. That's right, so we train 7,500 models, we use our held aside validation set to pick the one that looks best for accuracy on each problem. And then on the big test sets that we have, we report the performance and convert them to the standardized scale. Yeah, th thank you. I should have said that. 
So I know that the big the high dimensional case is different, but is it the same in this sense that if you do the same thing with high dimensional data, you get a similar story? I, I would mm. think that you'd not have a fit nearly as much. You know, I mean, lots of different right, data, so. right. The differences between methods um, start to become less in very high dimensions, and the linear methods catch up with all the other methods, and then a few methods clearly break. Uh, and boosting is one of them. So, so boosting just overfits dramatically in very high dimension, uh, unless you've done something special to regularize it. Good question. So the high dimensional experiment we've only done with the natural size of the data sets as other people experimented with them. And for these data sets, we've only done experiments with the sort of 5,000 training sets. So I've, I've never actually been able to do the learning curve. The experiments are expensive. It takes, uh, it takes us several months to, to create this table. And in high dimensions, it, it took even more time. And we had to write a bunch of special purpose code, in fact, to, to do the high dimensional experiments. It, it just wasn't that easy to train some of these things uh, on that high dimension. Yeah. Sure. Oh, uh, which single model? Uh, so it, it does turn out that the best single model on average is boosted trees. Uh, um, oh, 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 I'm sorry. So, so this, this thing you know, could be uh, two neural nets uh, on two problems. It could be uh, three boosted trees on three other problems. It could be random forests on uh, four more problems. It could be logistic regression on one problem and boosted stumps on another problem. And that's for accuracy. And then when we go to ROC area, it may prefer very different models. It might suddenly prefer neural nets and k-nearest neighbor. In fact, k-nearest neighbor and neural nets do quite well on, on ordering things like ROC. So, so there's no easy answer to that. But the important thing is that it's not the case that just sticking with the few best methods is safe. If you want to really achieve the ultimate performance, you actually do it, sadly. <laughs> it looks like you have to sort of try everything and then you know, be a good empiricist and use a validation set to pick the best thing. Okay, so, so that's the, the takeaway take message from this. Okay, so now we're going to make that a little worse. Now, I've just said that if you really want high performance, you have to train 7,500 models or 2,500 models and calibrate them in different ways and then use the validation set to pick the best. Well, can we do something better than just picking the best? I mean, you know, we all know what ensembles are. You know, can't we form an ensemble out of these many models we've just trained and possibly do even better than just the best single model in that set? Um, and you guys all, all know that as long as we have a bunch of classifiers, many of which are accurate, and hopefully they're different from each other, that there's a diversity in the models, there's a very good chance we'll be able to form an ensemble that's better than any one of those models. Um, Lots of ensemble methods around. In fact, we're using some of them in the table. There are things we're not using or correcting codes. There are lots of other things we could just do. We could just take an average of all those models. We could do Bayesian model averaging where you take an average, but you now weight it by the performance of the models. So higher performing models get more weight. We could do stacking, which is trying to learn a combining model on top of the predictions of all those models using the validation set as the training set for the stacking model. All these ensemble models, methods really differ in just two ways. One, how are the base level models generated? And then secondly, how are those models combined? Okay, so, so the base level models are generated by the process we just described. We're not gonna try to build an ensemble out of those things. So basically we just you know, train every model you know, in the kitchen sink we can think of, right? We just train everything. Everything that makes any sense that we can afford to do and we keep it. Uh, and now we're gonna try to combine them in different ways. So let's do that. So I've, I've pruned the bottom of the table, but here's the top of the, the table. Here's the best line, which is all before. You can now think of best as an ensemble, right? It's the ensemble which puts weight one on one of the models and weight zero on all of the other models. So it's a funny ensemble. You can't expect it to do better than the best model since it is the best model. Um, so, so stacking, what we've done is we've tried to use, say, logistic regression to combine all the predictions. We tried, uh, that didn't work very well, so we then tried using SVMs to combine the predictions. We had a lot of trouble. You'll notice the performance is not very good. Um, and we had a lot of trouble because the 7,500 models are all very correlated with each other, and our validation set is modest. It's only 1,000 points that we've held aside for validation. So the stacking always overfits dramatically. Now, of course, we can set parameters for stacking so that it does something like just take the average 
of everything, right? We, we could tune stacking that way. But we wanted stacking to have the freedom to hang itself, uh, if that's what it was going to do. And we didn't force it to do average all because we have that as our own separate line in the table. Um, this poor performance we got with stacking, and you know, base averaging, by the way, does just, uh, this is not statistically meaningful, just epsilon better than picking the best single model. Um, there are different ways of doing Bayesian averaging. We're just exploring one particular approach there. And now that we've made this work publicly uh, available, other people have come to us and suggested other approaches. We think that our results with both stacking and Bayesian averaging are not the best that can be achieved. Okay, so we're confident if we spent some more time. We, we put a fair amount of effort into it. We were surprised they weren't better. We thought they just would be right out of the box. Uh, we put some time into it, but we were surprised with the difficulty we had getting improvements from these things. Um, but we sh we're sure there are ways to make this work. It's, it's just that in the sort of month that we spent trying to make it work, we didn't hit on it. Okay. Um, it'll turn out for the model compression story I'm going to talk about uh, soon, it doesn't matter. If you can make one of these things work, that's great. And you're still going to need the model compression <laughs> that I'm going to talk about. So, but what we're going to do is just create our own uh, stacker to combine these predictions. Um, and we call it ensemble selection because we were disappointed that those methods didn't work. We really thought there must be a way of getting even better performance after this, out of this large set of models. So we just quickly tried something and it sort of paid off right away. So, so let me describe that to you quickly. I won't go into the details of this thing. Train lots of different models using all the parameters and stuff you can. You've already seen that we're doing that. Uh, just add all the models to a library. Don't throw any of them away. No pruning of models or anything like that. Just keep them all around. And then we're just going to do good old forward stepwise selection. So if you've done forward stepwise feature selection, which has been around for 50 or more years, we're just going to do forward stepwise model selection. Just one at a time, we're going to add models from this collection into the ensemble in an attempt to keep making it greedily hill climb towards better performance. Um, so let me just walk you through that. So here's, uh, here's 7,500 models. OK, um, there's our ensemble, which we start off with nothing in it. And we've been asked to uh, build an ensemble that optimizes area under the ROC curve. OK, so that's our job. Nice thing about this method is you can optimize to any performance metric, as long as you can calculate it reasonably fast. Here's the ROC of each of these models individually. We find the one that has the best ROC, and we put it in the ensemble. OK, so now the ensemble just is the best model. So it's now equivalent to that best line in the table, in fact. It's not an ensemble yet. OK, so that model's now in there. Now we go back to the remaining models, and we figure out what would the ROC be if this model, model 5, were to be added to model 3 and their predictions averaged. OK? So it turns out to be 0.9047. That's not an improvement. 9126, that's not an improvement. Oop, that looks pretty good. That would be better than what we've got up there, 9384. So we find the model of the ones that are left that would be best to add to the ensemble, and then we add it. Why sure. You can, imagine you, you can imagine different weights. We find it every time we make it too flexible, it overfits. <laughs> um, if we had 10 or 100 times more data, the world would look quite different. Um, and we were able to get mileage out of this very simple method. Um, yeah, the, the only thing we do end up doing is we actually do. Uh, I'm not showing it here, but we do greedy selection with replacement, which means a model can be added two or three times. Turns out that's important for reasons I won't go into. And when a model is added three times, it does get three times the weight of a model that's added once. So, so we do let it very crudely adapt the weights. Um, OK, so we go back to the well. We find the model that, when added to the ensemble, would make it best. And we add it. And we just keep repeating this until things stop getting better. OK? Uh, now, the more models you've got, the better chance you have of finding a diverse set of high-performing models that actually work together in a way that gives you high performance. That's great. But this overfitting really is a killer when, when you have this little data. And we've had to come up with a number of tricks to mitigate this overfitting. And if you, I, I just, I'm telling you this because it's so natural to want to go and try this if you've trained a bunch of models. And you might not realize that overfit, if, you don't mitig if you don't control overfitting, you'll actually do worse than if you didn't do this in the first place. You'll, you're better off just picking the best model uh, than trying to greedily form an ensemble if you don't control overfitting. So, so this is critical. That's the subject of another paper. We, we won't go into that. But you have to do something to take care of it. We have some hacks for doing it. Works well. Um, here's how well it works. So there's ensemble selection added to the top of the table. And I've rebolded all these entries. 
And I think you can see ensemble selection has gotten, remember this best line was really, ex I mean, these were pretty good performance down here. Right? These are some, some world-class models, and we're trying sort of every variation of them under the sun that we could afford to try. And then picking the best out of all of these things down here was much, much better. Well, there's yet this other big increment by taking this ensemble of, uh, of those different models. Okay, so, so that's nice, right? I mean, that's what we were hoping to see, and with some effort, we, we actually got that. So, so that really is... I mean, in some sense, it's beyond state-of-the-art performance for, for simple machine learning. Yeah? And do you think, I mean, like, because in principle, right, like the, the Bayesian average or, you know, I mean, any weighting scheme could have achieved uh, the ensemble such as yes. by putting ones and zeros everywhere else. Right? Uh, exactly. But in fact, it doesn't because it's overfitting of the small dev set. That, 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 that's exactly right. I mean, so there's something about the greedy forward stepwise selection process with our overfitting controls that makes it just a more effective algorithm. Um, than other, these other methods, which should have been able to, to do it, but somehow couldn't. I mean, yes? You're not, I mean, you're not, you're not you're absolutely right. guaranteed that, or, or are you, that, that, would, that the rise would be monotonic in the oh, No, 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 no. In, in fact, the graphs are quite noisy. It okay. uh, turns out that sampling with replacement makes them better behaved. It's one of the reasons why, why we do that. And it, it turns out, by the way, occasionally this thing overfits, and in fact, you would be better off for some problem in some metric just picking the best model, and this thing is epsilon worse than, than that. It did something, you know, it picked the best model and put it in first, and then it made mistakes afterwards. Yeah, but on average, across many problems and metrics, it, its performance is quite, quite good. So if your validation set was larger, would uh, these results still hold? Uh, if the validation set was larger, I think the results would still hold, but stacking... Uh, and Bayesian averaging, I think, would be doing much better. Yeah, that they would be competitive, and in fact, it's possible that they would, would outperform, outperform this. Bayesian averaging, you know, I tend, we could talk about this afterwards, it's sort of a philosophical question. I tend not to think of Bayesian averaging as being as much of an ensemble method as being a hedging your bets method. Um, so, but we, we could talk about that later. It'd be, be fun to hear what your opinions were on that. Have you tried to explicitly incorporate diversity? Uh, oh, it's a, it's, a, it's a great, we did, um, and we read papers on how to calculate diversity between models. And the funny thing is we never got any mileage out of it better than ensemble selection. And in fact, it was hard to duplicate the performance. If you think about it, by greedily selecting the next model to add to the ensemble to make its performances, in some sense, it's implicitly thinking about diversity, even though it has no explicit measures of diversity. It is going for the model from the large set that when it adds to the models already there, sort of maximizes performance, and the odds are they're diverse. And it turns out if you look at the models that get put into the ensembles, it's really fascinating. It never, ever, not on a single problem or metric, sits there and sort of chews up 90% on one model class and then just adds a few others. It's not like that at all. So it, it pulls in 23% uh, of this class, and. 16% of that class, and it turns out you're after squared R, so it throws in a bunch of neural nets. It's very interesting to see what it likes to use. It, it, it's just fun. You can spend, a, you can spend days <laughs> uh, just looking at the ensembles and sort of telling yourself stories about them. Yeah. Did you ever try using the original training set for doing this ensemble selection instead of the validation? Uh, yeah, yeah, and it just fails terribly. So it turns out the performance of the models can be so good on the training set that it just fools itself yeah. right off the bat. Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, you have to have the independent validation set or else it really, really does bad things. There are tricks you can do with five-fold cross-validation so that you ultimately get to train on everything and validate on everything. It takes more, more effort to do it, but, but it does work. Yeah. Sure. Do you have any insights as to what it is about these different data sets that prefer it? I mean, ideally, you'd have some simple method. You yeah, that yeah. That says, no, you yeah. should use back trees for this or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So not having to train the back trees to find out that we, we did get some insights, but I wouldn't want to... They're, they're almost the kind of insights you would have before, before you looked at the result. I mean, realize we only have 13 data sets, and we don't have any well-defined way of characterizing them. So we have a small sample size in, in that sense. But you do see things like data sets that we knew were noisy because of our previous experience with them. Those are the ones boosted trees do not do well on. Although random forests still do quite nicely on them. Bagging does quite well, and boosted stumps do quite well. So, so things that you, you would expect sort of happen, th things like that. Um, but I can't say we've had too many Eurekas, like, ah, oh, 
if the ratio of uh, nominal attributes <laughs> to continuous attributes is, is greater than 0.5, uh, then you should be using memory-based learning. Uh, we, sadly, if, if we could do the same sort of experiment, but now with hundreds of data sets, now we could actually do even sort of machine learning to try to take the characteristics of the data sets and predict what model would do well on it and what would do poorly, and that would be fascinating. Would be so, so, but we'd have to increase an order of magnitude or, or two orders of magnitude to be able to even touch that. So it's a great, great challenge, though. Okay, so this thing really works. It's kind of nice. This really is phenomenal performance. I mean, if you've got a limited amount of training data and you want great, great performance, and you know every little improvement you get makes a big difference. You know, it either saves a live. Uh, somewhere or it you know increases your, your bottom line by a million dollars I mean th this is a good technique okay so so it really works well it's interesting that we haven't hit the supervised learning ceiling yet right I mean with some fairly simple stuff like training a bunch of models picking the best and then forming a greedy ensemble out of them we're really upping the performances that that we see quite a quite a bit um, and it's cool that you can optimize these things to any performance metric. That's one reason why they work well. Like, we don't know how to train neural nets to any performance metric, but we can optimize this ensemble easily to any metric. So that's kind of nice. And it works even when some of the base level models aren't good on those metrics, because it can still form combinations of models that work well on that metric, even though no one of the models worked well on that metric. So it, so it has some room to sort of improve over what the base level models can do. And then there are some, some nice things, like it takes you know, a long time to train all those base level models. But forming the ensemble just takes seconds on the laptop. It's actually the greedy forward selection, it just flies through that. Um, and that's because we cache all the predictions. It's, it's actually quite fast. Um, and there are cool things you can do, like uh, you can imagine that the world changes. You have some new small sample of labeled training data. Well, you don't retrain all the base level models. Maybe you don't even have enough data to do that. But you could redo the model selection to build the ensemble. You know, just like that, you could do that every 10 minutes if you wanted to, you know, if it was the stock market or something. You'd have to have labeled data, you know, a new validation set to do it. But, so this has some nice properties, okay? So, so this is good. There's a really big problem. And this is the, right, this was all motivation. <laughs> so, uh, so there was a really big problem. Uh, and the problem is that these things are big. Way, way too big. Okay, so, so now think about it. I mean, some of the base level models are things like boosted trees and random forests and bagging and k nearest neighbor. So I just pulled an ensemble out, and this ensemble had 72 boosted trees in it. Now, each boosted tree can have either 1,000 or 2,000 trees in it, right? So those 72 boosted trees turned out to be 28,000 trees, okay? It had only one random forest. This one didn't like random forest, but even that had another 1,000 trees in it. Um, it had five bag trees, so that was 500 more trees. So there's a lot of trees <laughs> in here. It had 44 neural nets of different sizes, <laughs> uh, so that was a total of 2,200 hidden units that got added. So it's a large number of weights. It had 115 memory-based learning models in it, right? So, <laughs> so, so, and it had a bunch of SVMs, okay? Different ones, you know, RBF kernels, you know, whatever. Boosted stumps, you get the picture, okay? So it's a big thing. This particular one takes about a gigabyte to store all those models. Gigabytes are still big things. Um, and it takes almost a second to execute that huge number of models to then take the average prediction to make a prediction for one test case. Uh, I'll show you the typical results. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not atypical. Yeah, it's slightly larger than typical because it makes it more fun. But, but, uh, yeah. but it's, it's not that atypical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good question. Okay, was that your question as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and I just want to convince you this really is a big problem. I mean, so think about web search, right? You know, what do you get, a billion queries, you know, a week, a month, wh whatever? Well, you're not going to execute this thing a billion times. I mean, you're not even going to execute it a billion times to cast the results. You, you know, a billion is, is a lot. Uh, so the test set's large, and if you really want to use the thing in real time, you haven't got a chance, right? right? It is longer than the delay that's allowed when the answer has to get back to the user. So, so, and you can try to parallelize it, right? I guess, you know, if I had 30,000 models in there, maybe you could dedicate 30,000 machines, each one to its own model, and, but the communication cost would, it, right? It's just not gonna work. Okay, so not gonna use it for web search. You're not gonna do face recognition by scanning your little box 
across your image at multiple scales to try to find faces, right? Because again, the test set's going to be too big. And if you're trying to do this on video, it'd be even worse than, than still images. Satellites, think about it. You know, the, the memory that they put in satellites is still like PCs of, you know, a decade or more ago, right? So it's hardened memory, so it's small. That means you can't fit these models in memory anymore. God knows you don't want to go to secondary storage to get to them, right? So, so you can't do that. The processors have very little speed, very little power. They're never going to put these on a satellite. Not going to put them on a Mars rover. It, just the power considerations alone would prevent you from putting it on a Mars rover. Same thing for hearing aids. You know, you could spend a lot of money on hearing aids. People will pay money to hear. Um, but you're just never going to have the power there unless you start putting little nuclear power plants in their ear. Um, PDAs and cell phones, now cost is a real issue. I mean, maybe, maybe PDAs are getting powerful enough that they could start to do this. Well, it depends on what you're using it for. But uh, if it's just trying to figure out where you're trying to go or what restaurant you're interested in, maybe you could afford it. But then the cost would be prohibitive. You know, you, you, you know th these things are at the margin. An extra 10 cents on the cost of a phone is significant. Uh, digital cameras, okay, so you've got the picture. You really aren't going to be able to use these things for a large number of applications in which you would like to use them. Prevented it from getting so large artificially. What the hidden performance is? We, if you really needed that size, or if you could still do quite. We we did try that, um, and there is work on taking ensembles and trying to prune them, to sort of make them smaller. And we never had that much success. And we think the reason why is, the diversity really is important to why the ensemble works so much better uh, than the the individual models. And as we started to sort of, I mean, we can cut them in size by half and get the, ultimately the same performance. But half isn't enough to make a difference. We can't cut it in size by a factor of 10 or 100 and keep the same performance because the diversity seems to be so important. OK, so this really is a nasty problem. All these applications are sort of out the window. Um, and you know, in some sense, you might say, well, maybe this is you know, Bryman's, Bryman's constant come back to haunt us, <laughs> right? You know, it's, it's true. <laughs> If you, want, if you want low error, you're going to pay the complexity price and, you know, just too bad. You're, you can't have low error on these applications. <laughs> it's just the way it is. Well, that would be a sad day, and if that was the answer, I would stop now <laughs> and take questions. So um, we're going to have an approach to this, which is model compression. And what we're going to do is you train that model any way you want. We're going to use ensemble selection. And then we're going to train a simpler model to mimic that complex model. And the way we're going to do that is a trick that people have used for other reasons. We're going to pass a bunch of unlabeled data through the complex ensemble and collect its predictions. It's unlabeled data. We don't know what the real answer is. So we get the predictions from this ensemble because we just want to mimic that complex model. We let this thing label our unlabeled data. We now have this very large unlabeled data set. And now we're going to use that large unlabeled data set to train what is hopefully going to be a smaller sort of mimic copycat model. And if we're successful, this thing will look just like the function that was learned by the complex thing, but it'll do it in a smaller package. So, so that's the game. Let me just show you right away one of the results, okay, to show you that this is possible to make sense. This is squared error, so down is good. This is the number of hidden units. We're using a neural net as the mimic model here. So the neural net is trying to mimic an ensemble. This is the number of hidden units in the neural net. Uh, we've, done the trick I just described. We've taken a bunch of unlabeled data, labeled it with the ensemble. The performance of the ensemble is this squared error. That's actually very good. It's an excellent model. The performance of the best neural net we could train on the original data was this good. It's not a bad model, but it's not that good. That's the model we want to deploy. That's the best neural net we knew how to train. This is the best neural net we can train using this sort of you know, compression trick, and you notice we get really close to the performance of the ensemble with a neural, this is a log scale with a neural net that has sort of 32, 64. It's a modest sized neural net, right? It's not a billion hidden units down here. This thing is nowhere near the complexity of the ensemble. Uh, depends on how you measure complexity now. <laughs> uh, can you give us a sense? Is it a thousand times? The, the, it, it's it's uh, several thousand times faster and several thousand times smaller. Yeah, yeah. So and I'll, I'll show you some tables of, of those results. Is it as complex as the one that you showed? Or? Uh, this is actually an average over several ex several data sets. Uh, I wasn't going to tell you that, but but it's actually an average over several data sets. So so there's no one ensemble. So you yeah. Have a consistent lift up. No, 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 no. In fact, I'll show you some results where that doesn't happen. Yeah. 
data? No, it's a, it's a very good question. And if we had enough uh, synthetic data, you probably would never see a lift because the neural net could never overfit because we all... Exactly, exactly. It just takes time. It just takes time to make the data and then time to train the neural net. Right, right. So, so we're always trying to sort of do, do this game with as little data as possible. No, no, no. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. We'll, we'll, we'll buy the extra cluster and spend the extra month. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree completely. Yeah. When you're trying to mimic, are you trying to mimic just the target outputs or things like confidences as well? Ah, good, good question. Just the outputs. Right. Now, uh, I should tell you my personal approach to this is still all uh, Boolean classification. My personal approach is to always try to predict the probability of something being in the classes. So I have continuous numbers coming out of these models. So we're actually trying to mimic the continuous numbers. As a, yeah, yeah, so, so thanks. Okay, so that's a preview of things to come. That, that, that's where we're going. And now we'll just talk about this process and you know, when it works and doesn't work and how to make it better. Okay, why neural nets? <laughs> well, <laughs> we tried it with decision trees. I've seen some large decision trees in my, my day, but never this big. They had to be humongously large before with high fidelity they could model the ensemble. We had to keep modifying the code so they could keep training bigger trees. Um, and you've got another problem, which is that recursive partitioning sort of keeps running out of data. So you end up having to have very large labeled synthetic data sets so that you can grow very large trees in the first place. So, so it's just painful. It's not very good compression because the tree is huge. You need a huge amount of data to do it. It wasn't a win um, in our experiment so far. Support vector machines are a little more promising. And on some problems, it turns out you can get a reasonable performing support vector machine. On other problems, though, the number of support vectors you needed in order to get high performance just sort of went exponential. We just needed some, some huge number. Now, you could use a trick like Chris Burgess's trick from way back in 96, right, right, for, for uh, basically pruning away the least important support vectors and trying to minimize that. And we, we haven't done that. So, um, hey, everybody knows that, you know, k-nearest neighbor is Bayes optimal if the training set is large enough. No reason to think it wouldn't work well here. The, the problem is the training set would have to be extremely large. Um, but there might be tricks, you know, with, with good kernels and clever data structures and pruning of the training set, th things that people have all done research on, that might make this feasible in some applications. But, but it's not going to be feasible sort of simple right out of the box. You'll have to do a lot of work, I think, to make it feasible. So in the neural nets, you know, we just, we tried these things and the neural nets, we just tried them. And it was like, wow. <laughs> you know, we didn't have to work <laughs> to make them work. So, so we stuck with the neural nets. It does not mean that we would ignore these other things. There are times, as you're going to see, every now and then the neural net has trouble and we'd have to use something else. Sure. Did you take any care with the input density to match the density of the problems that you originally trained on and how sensitive was it? Yes, yes. So, so that's exactly where we're going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And are these on the low dimensional? State? Yeah, this, this is all the 20 to 200 dimensional problems. I don't know how well, the, the pro, our method is going to depend on density estimation to create the synthetic data. And I don't know how well our method would do in very high dimensions since the world really changes up there. Yeah. Did you ever compare this to like the deep delete nets? Which is no, no, no. I, I, have that, I have that in the future work slide that I know we'll never get to. <laughs> 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 uh, but, but we haven't done that. I mean, and it's definitely a work in progress. I see us as being sort of halfway there. We've got that first really promising proof of concept. It's actually already useful for a whole number of things. But there's a whole lot of additional work you'd like to do to say you really understand it and to know when it's best and to know when you should do something else. Yeah. Do you think it's mm -hmm. critical at all that neural nets were one of the base learners that you're using? I mean, you, it, no, no. We could just throw the neural nets out of the base learners. It wouldn't be a problem. OK, so this is a generic technique. You don't even have to use it for classification. It could be used to have a thing. Could, could, could be used to mimic any function. Right. Right. Or right. even not in a vector space, like sequence learning. Conceivably, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's completely generic. There's nothing, there's nothing we've done, and there's no result we've had that makes me believe it's sensitive to any of those details. Yeah. So does the previous graph really sort of say that that the whole thing was just a question of how much data you had to train in the first place, and not anything about the diversity? Uh, of the I, I think this is a good interpretation that if we had had you know a million labeled points to begin with. Well, we would have gotten a neural net that was this good or even better in the first place. But we never had that data to begin with. And for some reason, backprop and all the variations of it that we've tried aren't capable themselves of learning this good of a model from the limited training set. 
So we have to go through this really awkward <laughs> uh, neural net training algorithm, which first trains a whole bunch of other things and then builds an ensemble and then hallucinates some synthetic data, labels it with that ensemble, and then trains the neural net. It turns out that neural net training algorithm is, is quite effective. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you would still get sort of with the ensemble, it would uh, get 10 million. Yeah, that, that's a good question. So one thing we don't know is how much extra lift we would get from these ensembles if we were really in the data rich regime. And, and there's a chance that, you know, just good old boosting, which is such a powerful learning method. If you can feed in enough data to prevent overfitting, there's a chance that just good old boosting is going to hit the asymptote and nothing is really going to going to be able to best that. Uh, that. That's what I believe, but I don't know that for a fact. And yeah. There's nothing in the method that says you must use synthetic, right? If you have an ability ah, right, 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 right. It turns out if you're in a world where you have, re and I'll show you some results which show that when you've got that, you're golden. That, that the using the synthetic data hurts you. The goal is to make it just not hurt you so much that it makes it impossible. Yeah, so. Do the sure. themselves as the of some <coughs> sort of magical black box. Ab absolutely. And then you've got enough data, you're just training on, on large data. But that, that's absolutely right. I mean, all we're doing is we're just training a neural net on a large training set. Now, the large training set happened to come from this other model whose performance we really envy. <laughs> uh, so we did this sort of complex machinations to sort of extensionally represent the function <laughs> and capture it in this training set. And now we're just training a neural net to, to do it. Yeah, and that's it. Anything that'll give you that large data set, well, I mean, anything that'll give you a large good training set, you'll be able to train a good model out of it. And it probably wouldn't even have to be a neural net. Yeah, so th these are all good questions. And in fact, I'll skip through slides later on because we're, we're hitting all the points now, which is perfectly fine. Okay, um, so neural nets are good. We're getting, Surprisingly good compression with the neural nets. I'll show you some results. And the execution cost is low. You know, these are all just one hidden layer neural nets. So, you know, it's just like some matrix multiplies. I mean, it's, it can be parallelized, right? They were building hardware to do this a decade ago. So, so you can make this as fast as you want. It could be a small part of your chip in your cell phone. You know, this is, this is trivial stuff. It is expensive to train these nets because we're going to train on maybe hundreds of thousands or millions of points. Any intelligibility you had, we probably lost it when we put it into a neural net. <laughs> um, but the truth is, if you started with ensemble selection, well, you didn't have intelligibility to begin with. So what maybe, uh, I'll show you, I think this stuff I'll show you only goes up to 400K, but there's clear evidence that we need to be going probably over a million on some problems. Uh, uh, say it again. Uh, so, so we get pretty good results with say 500,000, um, but for some problems you'll need 5 million. Yeah, how long did it take to oh, 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 it took us, we tend to use good old slow backprop as opposed to the, the faster second order methods um, because sometimes we don't get as good results with them. They seem more, more likely to overfit. Um, so it's definitely days uh, and in some cases weeks, but, but it depends on the dimensionality of the problem and how hard it is to learn. What is the dimensionality of that? Well, what's interesting, I'll show you some results where, you know, there are some problems where the eight hidden unit network just does it. And there are other problems where you need hundreds of hidden units, and those are the harder ones to learn. Yeah, yeah so, so it's very interesting. I'll, I'll show you those results, and if I don't satisfy you, definitely come back and ask me again. Okay, and the neural nets, you know, in some applications like web, real time, they, they may still not be fast enough. I mean, it, it could be logistic regression, and its cousins are going to sort of dominate in, in the web world for a long time, just for many reasons. Okay, we got this new problem, which we've already talked about, which is, you know, where's the unlabeled data come from? If you've got tons of unlabeled data, as you tend to have in text applications, web applications, image applications, that's great. I'll show you some results that shows you, you know, that's the best thing you could have. Often you don't have it. <laughs> Often all you've got is that original labeled training set, you know, which in our case is 5,000 points, and you just got to do the whole process with that. So you're going to have to hallucinate. Uh, some data. And it's critical to hallucinate that data well, right? You've got some manifold in a high dimensional space. You really want a sample from P of X. You want your samples to be on that manifold because you don't want this compression model learning anything about the function off of the manifold. You don't want to distract it. And you don't want to waste your samples off of the manifold, right? If you double the size of the manifold in each dimension in a high dimensional space, 
the vast majority of samples will not even be on the manifold of interest. And you've just wasted 99.9999% of your samples. So you can't do that. You have to stay true to the manifold as much as possible. And what we would like is something which is true to the manifold plus epsilon. Because that's better than being true to the manifold minus epsilon because then you miss the edge of the manifold and the edge of the manifold could be important. So that's what we're looking for. And all this gets harder as dimensionality increases. Okay, so what are we going to do? Um, we're going to just look at three methods here. One is the simple straw man, just do you know, univariate modeling of the density. Okay, and th that's not going to work well, as you know. An approach, which might be incredibly hard for ensembles, especially. But what if you tried to sample just around where the actual boundaries were? Like where the ah, right, 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 right. So some sort of active learning almost, yeah. where you're we're trying to focus on the, the classification region. As opposed to right. to so it wouldn't work for regression, yeah. and it might or might not work if you're trying to predict probabilities, but it might be great for classification. Oh, I see, I see. Or, 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 yeah. Well, no, no, no. I mean, there are times when classification is all that counts. But you want posteriors, so. It, well, I tend to like them, but, yeah. but it doesn't mean you have to have them in all applications. So, so it would be, be fun to talk about. Yeah? We just switched. So at the beginning of the talk, you're talking about a bunch of different problems data sets. Right. For this, you must be talking about one data set, right? Because you have one feature vector that's going to be very different for different data sets. Right. So, so actually... So which one are we talking about? Actually, I'm going to average over eight different data sets, which are a subset of the data sets from the early part, which you didn't see what they were anyway. Uh, so we're going to show you some results for eight different data sets. In some cases, I'll just average over all of them to give you the big picture. And in a few cases, I'll drill down and show you what happens with specific data sets. Yeah, that's good. All right, so I'll just look at you know, the straw man approach. This is Lowndes and Domingo's approach, naive Bayes estimation. I'll describe that and then our approach, Munging. Um, so let, let's say you know, this is a, uh, a representation of the true distribution that we would like to sample from. Okay, so that's a, think of that as an infinite sample of this nice 2D distribution. Um, and we'd like to be able to get samples like this. Okay, so that's just a subsample of this. That's the kind of thing we need to be able to generate those sorts of things. Okay, well one way we could do it is it's just 2D. We could just model uh, P of X1 and P of X2 individually. Maybe model them with a Gaussian or, you know, use your favorite method. It could be piecewise, splines. It could be anything you want. Just model these things separately so we're going to lose the conditional structure of the data. And let's see how that works. Okay, of course it doesn't work, right? It doesn't know anything about the hole in the middle. It doesn't know anything about the rounded off edges. Of course it generates bad samples. Now it does cover the space and maybe that's sufficient. So maybe covering the space, you know, it could be more efficient, but maybe covering the space is okay because that's what we, we need to cover the space. That's the most important thing. If you don't cover the space, you're just in trouble with compression. So there's an issue though, I mean, you only know your classifier performs well in the region in which it was actually been tested so far, right? I mean, right, so right, right. You have no idea what it's going to do off in the wacky space. Well, and, and the silliest thing is our goal is to mimic the thing. Who cares about mimicking it, mimicking it in the regions for which it didn't learn anything interesting and will never see a test case, right? We only want to mimic it on the manifold because that's the only place where it actually did anything interesting in the first place. Right, right. And, and we want to do that also because if you ask a model to learn about a whole bunch of other regions, it takes more, right, it takes more, more hidden units or whatever to do it. And it's a harder learning problem. It has to learn about a much larger part of the space most parts of which are probably just sort of crazy. <laughs> it's only on the manifold where it makes sense, right? Who knows what? It might just saturate, if you're lucky, in, in the off-manifold areas, which would be at least easier to learn. Or it might just do crazy, who knows? You know what polynomial curve fitting does with too many degrees of freedom. I wonder if you could even argue that like, in order to, because if you had data sampled everywhere, right? In right. order for a model to then replicate what the ensemble did, it would actually have to have the complexity of the ensemble. Oh, oh, right, right, right. Well, it wouldn't necessarily have to have the complexity of the ensemble. I think one of the reasons why these averages over many models are so effective in machine learning is because they actually yield a, a, a regularized model. They actually yield something simpler. Uh, it, the function, at least, is simpler, even though our way of representing it is more complex. So it, it just tells you about a weakness we still have in machine learning that we don't we don't know how to fix that problem other than by averaging a whole bunch of things. Um, yeah, so it, it depends on what we mean by complexity. Yeah. Okay, so, so this doesn't work so well. Um, clearly what happens is we lose all the conditional structure of the data. Uh, but who knows? Maybe it'll still work for compression, right? We're not really, our goal isn't really to generate good samples. <laughs> uh, our goal is to do compression. Maybe this will do it.
All right, so here's the experimental setup. We have eight problems. This is their dimensionality, 20 to 200. Uh, most of them are fairly balanced. Only one is this imbalance that has only 3% positive class. Training set size is always around 4,000, 5,000 points, and we have some pretty big test sets. Don't worry about that. Just needed to tell you that. Here's a graph. We're going to see a number of these graphs. This is squared error. Okay. This is the performance of ensemble selection. Okay. Uh, and this is the average over those eight problems. So you're going to be seeing an average graph. That's the target we want to hit ultimately. This is the performance of the best single models for those eight problems. Okay. Remember that is actually state of the art performance. You rarely have that performance yourself unless you've trained 7,500 models and picked the best. So that is truly ex excellent performance. Yeah, I mean, you could be happy with that. This is just even better, right? If you can get this, that, that's great. This is the performance of the best neural nets that we could train on the original data for those eight problems. So that's sort of, you know, hopefully we can beat that. All right? So this is what happens. And we're varying the size of this hallucinated synthetic data set that we've labeled with the ensemble. We're varying it, you know, from 4K to 400K on the bottom here. And uh, I think you can see the performance. I'll explain why we start at 4K in a second. Performance starts sort of comparable to a neural net, never really does much better than it, and actually does worse in the long run. So why does that happen? Well, God was nice enough to give us 4,000 labeled points. We would be crazy not to include them in the training set, since ultimately they are the function we were always interested in learning, not the ensemble. <laughs> uh, so we always start with the 4,000 labeled points that we had in the training set for the compression model. It'd just be stupid not to do that. And in this case, what happens is eventually you've hallucinated enough bad data and distracted the neural net enough that the 4,000 points get ganged up and ganged up upon. And the model is just no longer able to concentrate even on that function. And, and it does actually worse than having not done this at all. OK, so random data is not going to work well. OK, so obviously we have to do, sure? I would expect that graph to be even worse for the high dimension. I yes, yes, I, 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 I agree. It's, really worse. it's yeah. an average over all those eight problems. Okay. But if we went to 2,000 dimensions, I, I think you're right. It would just be, yeah, be terrible. Yeah. 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 OK, so we have to estimate the, the density. So let's look at this naive Bayes estimation algorithm. I'm going to run out of time, so let me do this very succinctly. Um, it's a very cool method. It wants to use naive Bayes to estimate density, but we all know naive Bayes is too simple of a model for, for anything complex. So what they do is this very clever thing. If they keep carving the space into smaller and smaller subregions, and every time they carve it, they try naive Bayes in that subregion. And if naive, ba naive Bayes looks accurate enough in that subregion, they don't carve it up anymore. But they keep carving the space until each subregion looks like it can be adequately modeled by something as simple as naive Bayes. So now they have this sort of piecewise model. It's a different naive Bayes estimator in all these different subregions. Some places get tiled with very small subregions. Some places have less conditional structure. They have very large subregions. It's all dynamic. It's very, very and it's for density estimation. And it's for density estimation. Ronnie Cavi did that many years ago for classification. Ah, oh, yeah, 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 yes, yes, yes. Yeah. The, this is for density estimation. But, but, um, and it's, it's kind of clever. Uh, it's efficient, which is nice, and they did it also because they needed to generate synthetic data. So, so in fact, it was just very natural for us to take their method and, and try it because their goal was, they weren't doing compression the same way we were doing it, they were trying to do something different. But, but ultimately they needed to generate synthetic data, and this was the method they came up with. It's a very appealing method. So we try it, and we could get their code, and their code not only did the density estimation, but it generated samples. Perfect. So we really got to use their method, and that's what we get. It's not bad, right? So you can clearly see the ring. You can kind of see there's you know, almost decision tree-like artifacts where they've carved the space up with uh, axis parallel splits and things like that. So you can almost see the way the space is carved. But it's not bad. OK, so the two problems with it are there is some artifact. That artifact would get nastier in high dimensions. 2D is a very nice world. And there's an awful lot of points that are sort of off manifold, a lot of points in the middle. A lot of points out here, right? Whereas those points shouldn't be there. But it's not bad. Okay, so we were very hopeful that this might have worked well. So let's try it. So now we've, this is the random thing. This is the performance we get now when we use this naive Bayes estimator. And it's not bad, right? So we have a neural net now trained with 25,000 points, 4,000 of which are the original training set, which is now doing as well as the best single model that could be trained. Okay, so th this thing, this neural net is now competing 
head to head with the best SVM, the best boosted trees, the, the best anything that, that could be trained. So, so that's actually good. That, that's already perhaps a useful result often enough. However, it does have this behavior that, you know, obviously we're not true enough to P of X and eventually it sort of hurts <laughs> on average. It's not like that for every problem. For some problems it keeps coming down, for other problems it goes, goes up. I'll show you some of those results if I have time. So it's not bad, it's promising, but we wanted to do better. We, we had hoped for more from this method. Um, sure. With the density estimation sort of uh, hallucinating area that doesn't matter anymore, it seems like if, as you increase the number of hidden units in the neural net, maybe that curve sort of goes up later and later. Uh, so, so we have tried varying the uh, number of hidden units here, and it does make a difference, but it's not as big of a difference as you would have thought. And that's because we do early stopping and regularization on the neural nets. So they're not going, even when their capacity is large, they're not doing insane things because we have validation sets. I mean, it's nice we can have as large a validation set as we can afford to label in this world. So data is, data is suddenly available to us in copious quantities because we're making it up. So, so that's a nice world to be in. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, we developed our own thing. It's called munching. Um, <laughs> uh, and if you look in the dictionary, munching will be defined as imperfectly transform information or to modify data in such a way that you can't describe what you did succinctly. And that's exactly what we wanted. <laughs> no, it, it turns out this is after the fact a good description of our algorithm. It's, it's not that we wanted those properties. Um, so here's the algorithm. So somebody gives you a training set and two parameters, this parameter P and S, which I'll tell you about, and then some, some label data, the, the original, and then it's gonna return the unlabeled data. And here's what you do, you make a copy of the labeled data Okay, and now you walk through all the cases in your data set one at a time. You find the nearest neighbor for each case using Euclidean distance. You know, good old K nearest neighbor. Find the nearest neighbor for each case. So, so I don't know if you two guys would stand up. So, well, you don't have to stand up. You're, you're fine. Um, so you are two cases and you're each other's nearest neighbor. Okay, so you're the first case I'm looking at and then I find that you're the nearest neighbor of this case. Okay, and now with probability P, we're going to take your attributes and maybe swap them. So we're going to swap your hair color. We're going to throw a coin, and if the coin lands heads, you know, we'd swap your hair color. And if your coin lands head again, we're going to swap your shoe size. And we're going to sort of mix and match you a little bit that way. For continuous attributes like heights, we're going to do something a little more complex. We don't want the heights, to, maybe the original set only has uh, 50 unique heights in it. We don't want to be restricted to those 50 unique heights. So in fact, what we'll do is we'll take your height, your height, we'll throw a little Gaussian around them, uh, and that's where this parameter S is. It's the width of the Gaussian we throw around your two points. And now we'll draw two new heights from this Gaussian and we'll replace each of your heights with those Gaussians. But that's it. So we just do that for all of your attributes. And what that does is it creates new guys like you, but where we've changed some things. So, and I hate to say the word genetic algorithm, but, um, <laughs> but it is kind of like genetic algorithms, except that the nearest neighbor is a critical step here. And you don't see that in GAs. So. Jed and I raised the thing the same thing, but, uh, but, but why not just uh, jitter the data with a, with a kernel, you know, and, and just, just sample a little Gaussian around each data point? And, and so, so we have tried that. The, the biggest difficulty is you have to model, you have to come up with an intelligent model of the jitter, and the, mo the jitter model also has to be conditional. If, if you just do it univariate, I, I don't know that it, it's going to work. Uh, couldn't you use the neighbor distribution? Oh, I see, I see. Uh, that might work. That, that might work. I think you'll still have to come up with these parameters, but you might be able to do it. Yeah. No, no, no. That, 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 that's interesting. Kind of like John's, you know, you could use the simplex sampling thing that you had where you took any well, that's, that's neighbors and sampled along that simplex. Uh, we would like to make this better, so it, I'd be interested in trying something. So now that I've switched to how it works with life, do you, do you run me through a classifier and check I've still got the same label? Uh, no, because we actually don't know what your label should be, and since it's a probability, we hope it will have changed. But in those cases where I have a label, you can check that that munging hasn't messed that up. Yeah, you're ignoring the label. It, yeah, no, we are ignoring the label, and we have tried taking the label into account to make this process better, and every time it's either hurt us or not helped right. us. Yeah, that, that seems like um, it should be the case, because in fact, you right. want to wait till you actually run the, because you're going to run the ensemble on that data, yeah, right? Because yeah. your ensemble has, has made a decision yeah. about where the boundaries actually are, and you want to maintain its version of where that is. You don't want to mess that up. This, this is just our way of sampling from the, sampling from the ensemble. Um, plus, 
you know, maybe you were class zero and you were class one, um, and you know, now that I've mixed you, it's not clear what you should be. So, and there are weird things about these probabilities. Like, it turns out if we do swapping with probability one, that's the same as doing swapping with probability zero. You know, we except for the continuous attributes. So, so values between zero and 0.5 are what makes sense. We use 0.2. Um, anyway, so we do this. We pass through the whole data set and we do it, and it comes up with a new data set. Uh, we use about 0.2 for that parameter. The variance parameter is not too critical. Um, don't worry about it. Uh, you can also modify this algorithm in interesting ways. You could do a bootstrap sample, for example, from the training set so that every time we have to generate more data, your nearest neighbor isn't always the same because maybe you won't be there the next time and your nearest neighbor. There are lots of variations to this, but I'll just show you results for one variation with one parameter setting. Um, so remember, oh, I'll, here I walk you through the algorithm, but I think you get the idea. Let's blow up on a small region. Uh, this is the point that we're picking. We find its nearest neighbor through distance calculation. That's its nearest neighbor. Uh, now what we do is we flip a coin and we swap some attributes, or in the case of continuous values, we hallucinate some similar, some similar points, and we end up generating these two new points from those two, two original points. And we just go through the whole process, and we keep doing that, and let me just, because you guys know how this works. Uh, yeah, so, and especially in high dimensions, right, simple things like Euclidean distance are probably not going to be adequate. So, I mean, in some sense, you always have low density in high dimensions unless the world is very nice to you. Um, so, I'm sure this process is going to break down in very high dimensions. It is doing well, though, up to 200 dimensions on our test problem so far. So, it's, it's not critically sensitive to this, but that is, a, is an important issue. Um, you can use another kernel if you want for measuring, finding who the neighbors are. So if you have some smart, even learned kernel, you could use that for your neighborhood function as opposed to using something simple like we're doing to try to mitigate this high dimensionality again. Um, okay, so that, remember that's the kind of sample we're hoping for. That's the kind of sample we get, sure. And how, how sensitive was it to those parameters? It's not that sensitive. Um, we find uh, the probability of, of swapping uh, you know, 0.1 to 0.3 works pretty well. I think we're using 0.2 in these experiments. And the uh, standard deviation for the continuous attribute, the only problem is if we set that too large, then it turns out um, that you really do expand the manifold too much. Um, but there's not too much penalty for setting it too small. You just then don't hallucinate as many new, new values. Do you impose the variance when applied as a price that you don't just like, measure uh, uh, the variance between the two samples? Good, good, good. I, I didn't go through the formula. So what we actually do is we have two samples. We calculate the standard deviation yeah. from the two samples, and then we divide by our control parameter, S, which just lets us ramp up or down the standard deviation and say, oh, only use half of the standard deviation or use three times the standard deviation. So, so it's, it just prevents things from going too far into the tails and then getting off manifold. Um, but it could be sensitive on some problems, but, but it hasn't been on the limited number of problems we've looked at. Yeah. It does pretty well. So those are samples generated by this munging problem. You can see we get you know, occasional thread-like structure, which I don't, you know, I mean, you can see in some cases they are sort of where other excursions existed in the real data, um, but not always. So, so interesting things happen, but it's pretty good. So just to compare, right, this is univariate random, which is not very good. This is naive Bayes' estimation, which is actually pretty nice, and that's what we're getting. So I think you can see that that's, that's definitely better. And this is just plotting them on top of each other. This is the goal. This is the real density. Remember, we want the real density plus epsilon. And I think you can see there's a little blue from munging sort of sticking out on the edges. And then the green is from naive Bayes' estimation. That's sticking out even more, and it's off sample. And then the red, of course, we never thought that was going to be good. Question is, does it work? OK, so it's a deceptively simple algorithm, but it's pretty effective. And in fact, I came up with this algorithm originally to do privacy preserving data mining. So we had real medical data. I wanted people to be able to do machine learning on it without screwing up the data, preserving the real properties of the data. But I couldn't give them the real data. So, so we did munging on the data to sort of you know, obfuscate it. Um, and it worked reasonably well. Um, it never explicitly models P of X, unlike other methods that you might imagine. It's more the data is the model, as in K nearest neighbor. And a critical thing is this nearest neighbor thing. 
That's what preserves the conditional structure. The fact that we're only swapping values among nearest neighbors is what means that conditional structure tends to be preserved. If you didn't do that, if, if we just swapped values between things that were very different, all the conditional structure would be gone. So, so that's, that's the important thing. Um, well, how well does it work? I need to wrap up here. That's the graph we saw before. And that's the graph we get with munging. Okay, so I think you can see that on average across these problems, as we start getting out to you know, a couple hundred thousand uh, pseudo-labeled data points, we're actually doing quite well. We're doing better than the best single model. And we're approaching the performance of that, that super ensemble. So, so we're getting there. That's very nice. Let me just walk you through some graphs. This is one particular problem. Random doesn't do very well. Naive Bayes estimation is not so bad. But we do much better. Don't you have to leave too now? <laughs> um, uh, but you can see that Munch is doing very well. Okay, and by the time you get out to a couple hundred thousand points, in fact, it's equal in performance to the target ensemble. Ah, okay. So I'll tell you about this in, in a second. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, here's a different data set. This is really, really nice. You love it when this happens. Uh, I mean, Munch is working very well. It's better than the ensemble. Okay, we are actually training a neural net that is somewhat better than the target ensemble. That's great. I mean, the neural net is sort of an additional regularizer on top of the ensemble, so you shouldn't be surprised. It could be this ensemble wasn't so big in the first place, so it might have had some rough edges, and maybe the neural net really is doing a, a good job of. Right, right, right. So, so the ensemble is trained on the original 4,000 labeled points, and then this is trained on that 4,000 plus a certain amount of, of hallucinated points. So, so this is great. Sometimes this happens, and, and that, that's wonderful, right? Now it's really a super, super neural net. It's better than even this other thing, which is really good. Um, what, if, what, if sure? you, what if you get one ensemble in a smaller training set and use that ensemble to label more of these hallucinated points? Oh, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> try to try to lift yourself up by your ensemble straps or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. That that's very interesting. Um, wow, I'm having trouble getting my head around what that would do. My guess is it would eventually hallucinate and go south, but there is a chance that it would just keep self-regularizing in an interesting way. Well, I, I have to think about that one. That, that's right. That for small data sets, they have to perform boost increase. That, that's right. So, so this is the um, uh, University of Texas, uh, Ray Mooney, and uh, thank you, thank you. In fact, I think I have it in the related work. So there, they use an algorithm like random. Actually, they don't use a very sophisticated way of generating uh, random data, but they generate this extra data to create diverse ensembles, and then they take the average of those more diverse ensembles. So the random data has forced diversity. And then that extra diversity pays off when you make the super ensemble and they get better performance. So uh, there's a chance this would, uh, I have to think about, uh, I like that question. So. And, and it sounds like the success of munging seems to, I mean, if, if, if you were to try to prove something about the success rate, it would probably involve like uh, assuming that, this, uh, that the space that your data comes yes. from can be well right. modeled by locally smooth um, rectangular patches, right? Right. And that you, basically the probability distribution is kind of locally exchangeable. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, Fernando Pereira saw this when I was presenting a poster on it uh, a couple years ago, and he said, it's really interesting. It seems to work really well, but man, you don't know why it works. <laughs> um, what could you prove about it? And that's one of our future works is it would be nice to have some idea of under what conditions is this most likely to work and under what conditions w would it fail yeah yeah well, something yeah. like two yeah. moons is going to fail well, I, mean, I hate the two moons data set because it's so if, if, if nearest neighbors really it's hard to say because our goal it's just sort of interleaving the two classes yeah, yeah classes. But, see as long as the ensemble has learned the two classes yeah. Our goal is ultimately just to mimic the ensemble. So as long as the ensemble could do the two classes, it's okay if the density estimation is not perfect. Um, it's, it doesn't depend. We want the density estimation to be as good as possible because then everything else is more efficient and we get better compression. But it doesn't have to be perfect. The ensemble, though, has to be as perfect as possible because it's ultimately the target. So, 
Okay, I better wrap up. So let me, um, anyway, sometimes we actually do better. Um, here's average results over the problems by number of hidden units. Okay, and I think you can see that we do sort of need a modest number of hidden units on average, 128, 256, to be able to do this compression. Um, here's if we look at these problems again, and this is where I'll tell you what these are. Letter P1, it turns out eight hidden units is almost enough. Letter P2, it turns out 128 still isn't enough. You need, you need a lot. Well, what's the difference between these? Letter P1, we're just trying to distinguish O from any other letter in the alphabet. Letter P2 is a much harder problem. Distinguish the first half of the alphabet from the second half of the alphabet. That's a hard problem. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. So th this is UC Irvine. <laughs> Um, uh, so this is a much harder problem, and interestingly, this thing tells us, oh, I need a much bigger neural net to learn the function that the ensemble has learned. So, so that's, that's kind of interesting. This might suggest that there's a way here of coming up with some crude measure of the intrinsic complexity of a function or of a data set uh, by sort of just saying, oh, you, you know, it was a, it was a 10 hidden unit problem. You know, wasn't an issue. And notice that you couldn't tell it was a 10 hidden unit problem using the original data because now there's all sorts of overfitting issues and sometimes big nets overfit less and that, that's complex. But here, you really can talk about overfitting in a controlled way because you have this sort of very large data set. So, so that's kind of interesting. Doesn't always work perfectly and then I will stop. Um, here's the tree cover type problem. You can see that even with 128 hidden units, although we're going downhill, we need a much bigger network. So the compression is not going to be as good on this problem if we need 1,000 or 2,000 hidden units. Right, it's no longer a tiny model. First two classes? Uh, the big two classes. Uh, I think we took the big class versus all other classes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, good, good question. I think it's a seven class problem. Mm -hmm. Right, so we converted it to binary by doing the, the major class versus all other classes. Yeah, thanks. Um, let me just show you this, okay, so See this gray line? All right, this is the line you saw before for munging for this data set. We need a lot of data, right? We, we not only need large networks, but we need you know, 400,000, 800,000, millions of points. This gray line, this is a large data set. So we actually can take a lot of the real labeled data, throw away the labels, treat it as unlabeled data, then label it with the ensemble. And we can ask what would happen if we had real unlabeled data from the right distribution. And notice it is significantly better than if we have to create synthetic data. If somebody gives you the real unlabeled data from the right distribution, almost always that's going to be significantly better performance by doing that. Now maybe we'll eventually get to the same place, you know, by having to create 10 times as much synthetic data. But boy, if you, if you have data from the right distribution, it's a, it's a good thing. And uh, I think I should wrap up. Here's a problem that's just, I'll, I'll end with this last problem. This problem is annoying. Uh, this is also a UC Irvine problem. And you can see, although we do marginally better than the best neural nets, uh, the best neural net on this problem, we don't do anywhere near as well uh, as the best single model, which wasn't a neural net, uh, or <laughs> as well as the ensemble. And notice there's a big gap between the best neural net and these other things. This seems to be a problem for which neural nets just do not do well. It's like neural net hard in, in some sense. And that's, that's interesting. So uh, we're interested in... Yeah, but some of the other data sets are very noisy too, and the neural nets actually do very well. I, I think it's also a sparse, one way of coding this, it creates pretty sparse. Uh, truth is though, neural nets in very high dimensions where the data is always sparse are doing quite well. So I don't know what it is about this problem, but it's interesting that we may be able to find problems which are just sort of one hidden layer neural net hard. You, you know. For some reason, it doesn't, doesn't work well. And this is one of those cases where we might really need to use an RBFSVM to do well on the, on the problem. We might have to use something else. OK, so I should. Sure. Run performance, though. I mean, I mean, you could try one of every single model, right? I mean, it doesn't, I mean as long as it's cheap, uh, as long as the model performance is cheap. Right, right. right. You, could, you could try everything and see what gave you the best compression. Right. For using, performance. Just using neural nets because that happened right. to be over the course of everything. Yeah, that was the best yes, yeah. you're, you're absolutely right. You can imagine a nice 2D plot, yeah. which was the uh, compression or speed up, and then on the other ax axis was the accuracy preserved. And you could pick wherever you wanted on the trade off curve. Right. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. All right, so let me just summarize the results, and then I have four seconds. Um, here are our problems. This is the uh, squared loss 
of the ensembles. Uh, let's just look at the average here. Just speed this all up. We're able to preserve, on average, 90. All right, so, so how do I measure this 97%? I take the squared error of the best neural nets we could train, and then I take the, best, the squared error of the ensemble, which is our target. And then I ask, when we compress, how much of that improvement do we capture? 97% means that we get 97% of the way from the best neural net to the ensemble model. So that's a much stricter way of measuring 97% than, say, taking baseline performance and saying we capture, because there we would capture 99.99%, right? So we're actually starting from a good model, a good neural net, and we're saying it has to be much better than that to, to, to be 97%. So we actually captured 97% of the accuracy of the target models. And that's only going out to, I think, 128 hidden units. And we know on one or two of the problems we would do better with more. Uh, and that's only going up to 400K training points. Um, so how about the compression, um, since that's the goal? Well, here's the size of the models in megabytes. The ensembles, on average, are half a gigabyte. The neural nets that you could train just on the original data are quite tiny. <laughs> the neural nets that we train to mimic this ensemble are bigger on average, you'd expect them to be, are bigger on average. So this is you know, a little bit of Breiman's constant sort of coming in there. Uh, they're bigger on average than these uh, humbler neural nets, but not that much bigger. And on average, we're getting a compression factor of about 2,000 of the neural nets compared to uh, the ensemble. But you know, the ensemble could be anything, right? It, could, it doesn't have to be our ensemble selection. It could just be any high-performing model that you have lying around. So this comparison is almost not so interesting. What I find interesting is this comparison, right? Which is that, you think of this as point 0.1 and point 0.3. By making the neural net just three times larger than you would have naturally made it, we get all this extra performance. That's really what counts, right? Because who knows what your target might have been. That's what counts. Three times the complexity, we get a great neural net out of the thing. In terms of speed, we get similar numbers. So this is the time to classify 10K examples. Um, so this is the number of seconds. The ensembles are quite slow, half a second per, per case. Okay? The, uh, the neural net is, is very speedy, <laughs> two seconds to do 10,000. And you could make that much, much faster if you wanted to. This is just a trivial implementation. We're just a little bit slower because we're a little bit bigger, as you'd expect. Not that much slower. And on average, we're speeding things up by a factor of about 1,000. So and that's, that's what we ultimately need. But again, this is probably the more interesting comparison. So we get all of that performance, but by only making a neural net about two or three times bigger and slower than it would have been had you just trained it naturally. That's what I like. So here's a summary. I think you know that. So let me just, I think you already know why it works. So I think all of our discussion has been, been about why it works. I just want to say, clearly, the fact that you have a large ensemble does not mean you have a complex function. And in fact, I think, as we said earlier, often these ensembles are reducing complexity, not increasing complexity. Um, so, uh, and I probably should skip this. Uh, yeah, I think I probably should skip it. So, well, unless you want to stay for three more minutes. So. Um, all of this work has been done with squared loss. Okay, I remember those big tables had you know, AUC and log loss and accuracy and F-score and all those things. Everything I've just shown you is just with squared loss. Okay? So an interesting question is, well, hey, if we compress an ensemble trained to minimize AUC and then train a neural net with squared loss to do that, <laughs> will it turn out to be good on AUC? And we typically see what I call this funnel of high performance. This is from a different set of work we've done. This is accuracy. So high accuracy is over here. This is ROC area, high ROC areas over here. Anybody who has to go, please, please go. Um, and we often see this kind of behavior, which is once you get to very high performance on a problem, this is two different metrics, right? Just a scatter plot, two different metrics. Lots of different models, neural nets, bag trees, boosted trees. You know, just, just wherever they fall, they fall. Once you get to very high performance, there's very little, if you're a great AUC, well, then you can have great accuracy by finding a good threshold. You can have good probabilistic prediction by doing something like plat scaling. Basically, if you have great a AUC, you can do well on almost every other metric. Any reasonable metric is going to sort of be great if you have good AUC. And that's true for most of these metrics. So all the metrics, when you get to the very high performing end, the funnel narrows. So to the extent that we can get our target ensemble in the high performing end, then I'm not too worried. It'll turn out the neural net can mimic it. It'll be good on any, any metric, modulo some small epsilon. However, on hard problems for which we can't hit 
the sort of high-performing acetate, which, let's face it, a lot of problems fall out here. It really is an open question whether us training a neural net to minimize squared loss will do it. Now, ultimately, if we have enough data and we exactly mimic the real values the ensemble is prediction, predicting, well, then we'll be equally good on all metrics because, you know, once, once you hit the target function, you've got it. But there really is a question there of how, far, how hard do you have to work to get this to be as effective with other metrics. And uh, I won't mention all these other things. There's just a, active learning would be fun, better ways of doing density estimation. When should we be using deep nets or some other model like pruned SVMs to do compression instead of this? Um, should we calibrate the models before we do the compression? Should we take the ensemble and calibrate it? Or should we train the neural net on the uncalibrated thing and then calibrate the neural net afterwards? Or should we calibrate twice before? And, uh, I mean, there are all sorts of funny extra questions. You know, does this all fall apart in high dimensions? There's some fun, uh, let me just mention one piece of <laughs> related work. So the early work of Craven and Shav Shavlik, um, and I think uh, Tal uh, did some of this even before then. Um, so what were they doing is they had neural nets, which were then the highest performing models I think we knew about on average, uh, but they weren't intelligible. Uh, so they were creating synthetic data to pass through the neural net to then train a decision tree to mimic the neural net so that they could understand the decision tree and thereby understand the neural net. And I think it's just ironic that in some sense we're doing the opposite. We're taking these ensembles of decision trees, you know, or ensembles of lots of things, and we're going the other way and we're trying to put them into a neural net in order to get a compact high performing model. We're losing intelligibility in the process. But, but I just think it's funny that, that they were doing something so similar 15 years ago. And, uh, and uh, I really should stop. So. So thank you and I apologize. So.